Courage, estrangement, connection. Hi, everyone. This is Heather Vickery, and you've tuned in to the Brave Files podcast. I'm so happy to have you here with us. Hey, are you searching for a last-minute holiday gift for your favorite brave, badass human? Well, be sure to visit the Vickery & Co. shop for an assortment of Brave AF, Resilient AF, and Grateful AF swag. We have everything from T-shirts to water bottles and mugs, notebooks, gratitude journals, and of course, copies of my brand new best-selling book, Fuck Fearless, Making the Brave Leap. There are a lot of goodies there, and I think most of them can get to you before Christmas. Visit vickeryandco.com slash store to check everything out. You can also pre-order a set of our Create Brave cards. They are a source for guiding and manifesting your next step. They will not be in stock until January, but once they're gone, they're gone. So if you're interested in getting a deck, go ahead and pre-order them right away. You can also secure your deck at vickeryandco.com slash store. And if there's something you want, but it won't make it in time for the holiday, we can get you a gift card. Just reach out and let me know. Okay, folks, today I'm chatting with the best-selling author of the brand new book, The Burning Light of Two Stars, Laura Davis. She is a multi-best-selling author, and she shares the story of writing her very first memoir. Laura, who's a survivor of childhood trauma and severe illness, was faced with a forced reconciliation with her mother in order to care for her mother during an illness at the end of her life. It's a really beautiful story, and Laura shares all of the details and so much more in this fabulous conversation. Laura's story is really one of strength, humility, and vulnerability, and Laura truly has had the courage to heal. We center this conversation a lot around the importance of sharing our core stories and how that helps us heal and connect. I hope you enjoy the episode. This is Heather Vickery, and you're listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. When we choose bravely in big and small ways, it powerfully elevates our lives. I hope these stories connect with you and encourage you to embrace bravery in every possible way, day after day. Together, we can build a movement of courageous living that enriches both our lives and our communities. And if you enjoy the show, I ask you to please share it with others. Maybe think of someone who you want to choose bravely right alongside you. Thanks for tuning in. Now here's the show. Years ago, I attended a live reading for a new show being produced by the About Face Theater, which is Chicago's LGBTQ theater. I was honored and privileged to be the vice president of the board for a couple of years, and I'm really passionate about what they do for the community. And this show was about stories and remembering the elder queer community and remembering what they had to go through to help us get to where we are now. Stories are important, both telling them and hearing them. And today we have best-selling author and writing instructor Laura Davis with us. And she's going to talk about her story, her story of survival, of rediscovering trauma, elderly care, and having the courage to care for a mother who had betrayed her and also her experience as an elder in the LGBTQ community. Laura, I'm so excited to have this conversation. Welcome to The Brave Files. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here with you. So you've had a big month. It's sort of been a whole launch month for you. You have a brand new book out. I do. Uh, it's my first, it's my my seventh book, I think. It's hard to keep keep track. And <laughs> it's my first memoir, so it feels quite significant. It's also the first book I've published in almost 20 years. Oh, wow. So it's been it percolating for a long time, and it took me 10 years um, to get it right, to get the story right and get it ready for the readers. So that fascinates me. Um, for I mean, just congratulations. And I love it. You've, you've written a lot of books. You've been writing for a long time. You're a writing instructor, you know, all sorts of wonderful things. But a memoir is different, right? Like, it feels like almost like you turned yourself inside out and said, okay, take, take a bite. <laughs> <laughs> it especially feels that way when you're writing the first drafts. You know, when you're getting the generating the raw material of the book, you have to delve back into 
all the challenging emotions you had mm-hmm. at the time. And th- this is a mother-daughter story. I had a, a very complicated, um, embattled relationship with my mother. We struggled from, you know, pretty much from my birth until her death. Um, for, so for decades and decades and decades, went through many permutations. And there were a lot of things that happened between us that were quite painful and difficult. And in order to write them successfully so that the reader feels like they're right in the room with us, it requires a willingness to feel all those feelings all over again. Um, And I I watch my own writing students and just I watch them dip into, it's like you're getting these painful jewels. That's the way I describe it. I like that. That's a really beautiful alliteration because it is painful, but also they are gifts. And I think you described it to me in a previous conversation as rediscovering trauma, like reliving these really painful moments in your life. Why did you do it? Why did you write the memoir? I think we all have certain core stories in us. And this is definitely one of mine, this this knot between my mother and I, you know, and how to mm-hmm. untangle this knot. Um, she was just a force that was larger than life for me. I, I felt like she was the radiant sun. And I was expected to be a little satellite going around her. Wow. And um, the problem was she gave birth to another son. You know, I'm a powerful, empowered person. It's taken me decades to get there. And so we began having conflict when I was a teenager. You know, as soon as I started asserting myself as a separate person who was not going to live my life according to her expectations, and then kind of one event after another deepened that rift. Um, and for us, the, the the final straw really was when I was um, 27 I began to remember having been sexually abused as a child by my grandfather, by her father. Oh, my gosh. And, um, you know, it was just so devastating. On one hand, it made my whole life make sense. And on the other hand, it felt like my whole life was being blown apart. And when I went to her, of course, naively, I wanted her support. And instead, she just really attacked me and absolutely chose her dead father over her living daughter. Um, and then, and then, soon after that, I teamed up with uh, poet and writer Ellen Bass, and we began working on the book that became *The Courage to Heal*, which was a uh, the first guide for women survivors of child sexual abuse. And it was really like how to heal, not just your life is ruined, but here's what you can do yeah. to reclaim your life, to reclaim your power. It was really a, a precursor to the Me Too movement today, and it was. Um, the first book of its kind, it became a talisman for millions of women, and it was just passed hand to hand and woman to woman. This is pre-internet, and it became this underground bestseller, and wow. it, it catapulted me into basically being famous for the worst thing that had ever happened to me. And so I was on the lecture circuit um, going around to inspire women that healing was possible. So the fact that I was being so public just made the rift between my mother and me so much worse, you know, so much worse. You know, I I was desperate for her to believe me, and she was just as desperate for me to recant and to say it never happened. And we were stuck there um, for many years. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. What does it feel like to... To be famous for the worst thing that's ever happened to you, to be on the speaker circuit and have to then continuously bring it back up and live through it again, over and over again. You know, it's such a unique and um, a mixed experience for me. I, On one hand, I felt incredibly honored to have touched this cord um, and to be able to stand up and touch people in such a deep, empowering way. And I, I always felt honored by the survivors who would come and they would tell me their stories and they would they would, you know, say, I, I'm alive because of your book. You know, when you hear mm. things like that, it's, it's gratifying, it's humbling. Um, but at the same time, being public like that and telling this story of trauma over and over again, it kept me in it. Mm. And at first that was okay because I was still really deeply into my own healing process, you know, going through the very steps that we were recommending in this book, Courage to Heal. Um, but as I, 
as a few, some years went by and I began to heal more deeply, I began to want my life to be more than just a reaction to this trauma I had experienced. I wanted to know who I could become beyond that. You know, what if it had never happened? Who who was I meant to be? And could mm. I move towards becoming that person? And I, I started to want, you know, like ordinary things. Like I wanted a family. I really wanted to have a baby. Um, I wanted to, I didn't want to walk down the street and have everyone come up and tell me their incest story. You know, I wanted yeah. to be able to move beyond this. And so really kind of at the peak of my success, I quit, um, not knowing what I was going to do next. And, and that was also the point where my mother and I were, you know, just at the worst polarization. Um, and, and it wasn't until I was able to heal enough from the damage that had been done to know that I could have a, a decent life, that I was even able to consider circling back and reexamining our relationship and whether it was something that I wanted to try to begin to reconcile. That makes a lot of sense to me. At some point, we have to say, I have taken this as far as I can in in my own way for my health and well-being, and it's time to is not hide it, but pack it away. Like, we're going to give it its spot, and and it can't be the center focus anymore. Yeah. So you have a little intro a little intro. You have an intro in your book <laughs> that I think gives a really beautiful, poignant preface for what we're talking about. Would you be willing to to read that for us? Sure. This this chapter, this is chapter two. Um, it's called The Call. And I think the main thing you need to know is when this takes place, I'm 51 years old. I have just gone through one year of really intensive treatment for breast cancer. And I have a very good prognosis. So this is like the end of my treatment, but it's been a year of just, you know, basically the underworld of illness is what I like to call it. So right before this scene, I go out in my backyard and there's um, a fire pit in our backyard. And I had this giant white stiff plastic binder from the Stanford Cancer Center and it had in it like all my medications and how I was supposed to do exercises and all my appointments and everybody's phone number and, you know, all the lab reports. And I just built a fire and one page at a time, I burned that notebook. And I wanted to release, again, being this sick person, you know, and um, mm -hmm. wanting to have time quiet time at home to process what I had just been through. I think anyone who's been through a major illness, you know that when you're in the crisis of the illness, you can't really process the impact of that illness on your life, you know, your brush with mortality. Yeah. Um, so I really wanted that. And I, and I just looked forward to these quiet months with my family, my partner, um, our two youngest children who were like 10 and 14 at the time, um, no bombshells, no lumps, no toxic surprises. Mm -hmm. I just wanted this stable, steady life so I could recover. So that happens immediately before this scene that I'm going to read you. Okay. Thank you for that. Two hours after my ceremony, I tasted my homemade tomato sauce simmering on the stove, added basil and oregano, a generous pinch of salt, a splash of red wine. Karen was picking up the kids on her way home from teaching reading at Watsonville High. They'd be home in half an hour. I was about to drop a handful of spaghetti into a pot of boiling water when the phone rang. It was my mother in New Jersey. We were due for a call. We hadn't spoken in several weeks. Cradling the phone between my neck and shoulder, I dropped the pasta into the pot, stirred to separate the strands. My glasses fogged with steam. I imagined her, smoking parliaments, curled up with an afghan on the couch in the den. She'd probably just gotten home from her poetry class, or her Shakespeare class, or her course in miracles study group. I could never track her schedule. I set the timer for 13 minutes. Lori, I've got a surprise for you. Oh, yeah? I was only half listening, maybe a quarter. I opened the fridge, rooted around for salad fixings. Why don't you guess? I don't know, Mom. 
What's the surprise? Don't you want to guess? I pictured her lighting another cigarette, residue of the day's lipsticks reddening the tip. Uh, you went to an audition and got a part in a play? No, I'm afraid my acting days are over. Guess again. Just tell me, Mom. Are you sure you want to know? Of course, I want to know. Darling, I finally made up my mind. She paused for effect. I'm moving to Santa Cruz. I wanted you to be the first to know. Blood rushed from my head. I closed the refrigerator, leaned back against the door. Pictures of the kids and little square art magnets clattered to the floor. It's true, years earlier, in a moment of generosity, I had invited Mom to move out to California when she got old. We talked about it once or twice, but I never thought she'd actually take me up on it. It had been ten years. It finally feels like the right time, Lori. New Jersey just isn't the same anymore. That's right. Your friends are dying off going into assisted living, or moving to be close to their children. Oh, my God. That's me! My hand tightened on the phone. My mother and I had been estranged for years. Yes, we'd forged a shaky peace, but 3,000 miles still separated us for a reason. Our reconciliation only went so far. I love Santa Cruz, and I love your family. Wow. Mom, that's amazing. I mean, great. I'm so happy. Well, that's good, darling, because I met with a real estate agent today. I've put my condo on the market. She says it's the perfect time to sell a place at the shore. I collapsed onto one of the red, cushy chairs at our yellow Formica kitchen table, stared at the black-and-white checkered linoleum. The floor needed a washing. Lori, are you there? Yeah, Mom. I'm here. You still want me, don't you? Of course, I want you. We all want you. It's just that I never thought you'd actually do it. Well... I'm not getting any younger. No, she wasn't. Mom was 80 years old, and her memory was failing. You don't sound very excited. I am excited. I'm just surprised, that's all. How could I possibly be excited? The woman who'd betrayed me at the worst moment of my life was moving to my town, and I was the one who'd invited her. A beep reverberated in my head and wouldn't stop. Mom was talking about escrow and how hard it was going to be to pack, but I barely heard her. She was the white noise in the background. I was hovering outside my body, listening to just one voice, the one screaming in my head taking up every inch of bandwidth. i finally gotten through cancer, and now this? Why the hell didn't you ask me? How about, Lori, do you remember that conversation we had ten years ago? I've been thinking about it more seriously and wonder if you think it would be a good idea. For you. For me. For us. For Karen and the kids. Or how about, Lori, I know you're just getting over cancer. Is this a good time for me to move across the country to live in your town? My friends told me about this gorgeous mobile home park right at the beach in Santa Cruz. De Anza, have you heard of it? Yes, Mom. I'll go right from one ocean to the other. So you'll stop by and talk to the manager? Sure. Happy to do that for you. I grabbed a brand new yellow legal pad. It had been months since I'd made a list. What would I have put on it? Take toxic drugs? Throw up? Smoke pot so you can eat? Grow white blood cells? Watch West Wing reruns? Survive? As I wrote, find mom a place to live, Dianza, 
on the pristine yellow page. Mom said, gotta run, darling. I promised your Aunt Ruth a call tonight. Click. She hung up on me. The timer was still beeping. I looked into the pot. The spaghetti had congealed into a gelatinous mush. I dumped it in the compost and set a fresh pot of water to boil. As I lifted the heavy pot, I knocked my favorite glass off the counter, and it shattered on the floor. The kids were going to walk in at any moment, and they'd be starving. I swept up the shards and set the table for four, but I couldn't remember which side the fork was supposed to go on. That's beautiful. <laughs> for folks who uh, are like, wow, Laura, you're a really good storyteller, narrator. Laura, you have a background in theater and broadcasting. And <laughs> it's beautiful. It's just, it's just so fun for me. I, I recorded the whole audiobook, and I just had so much fun. Uh, yeah. Doing that, I really enjoyed it. But that that sort of, you know, that's in literature, they call that the inciting incident. You know, that's the, yeah. that's the thing that kicks the whole story into being. And the question is, you know, for me was, can I become a caregiver for this elderly parent, this woman who betrayed me in the past? And yeah. could I open my heart to her after really having so many walls for so many years, for so many good reasons. Um, and, and could I become the daughter I wanted to be? You know, could mm. we could we heal our relationship beyond this kind of cordial truce that we had created with each other? Yeah. Well, we, we're not going to tell you guys the answer to that. you got to read Laura's book. <laughs> you might be able to guess, though. I don't know. Um, actually, I do know. But what I loved so much about that, I mean, the whole thing was really beautiful. That passage was this idea that this thing was happening and you had kind of created it. I mean, you're, clearly mom should have taken some responsibility for, as you, you said, let's talk about this. Did you still mean this or is this still healthy? But in the end, you had initiated it, even if it had been a decade before, and there's so many opportunities in life for us to go, this thing that is bad or weird or unfortunate, like, I started this. I did this. And we have to forgive ourselves and we have to work with ourselves. And can you speak to that part of the process a little bit? Yeah, you know, the, the invitation came. Um, there's, a, there's a story I tell about um, interviewing my mother for another. Uh, I wrote another, an earlier book about reconciliation called... I thought we'd never speak again. And there's, it's mostly about other people, and it's a kind of a how-to book, how to reconcile an estranged relationship or, you know, when is it or isn't it possible. But there was like a little thread of the story of my mom and me, you know, maybe like 2% of 100% of a book. But I didn't want those sections I had written about her to kind of catapult us back into being more estranged. You know, I wanted this book. I was right. writing about uh, reconciliation to improve our relationship, not to <laughs> hurt it. So yeah. I did have her read the manuscript. And it was, I just remember being on tender hooks the entire time. She was reading it. And, and the way I put it to her, is there something here that you can't live with? Yeah. You know, she knew, I, she, I, had, I already sort of, I told her I was writing this book. She had sort of given her permission in the abstract, but now it was like what was actually on the page. And I remember that was really incredibly um, difficult. And and one of the things she said, she she really didn't ask for that much, but what she wanted was, she said, I'd really like you to say more good things about me. <sighs> Which was, was so, I mean, I started to cry because... It, it made me realize how much I had fixated on her negative qualities. And they were legion. You know, I mean, she was an incredibly difficult mother for me. Um, and I really had to do a hell of a lot of work to establish a separate identity, to become my own separate adult, um, and to, you know, to feel empowered and not, not just cow when I was in her presence. So, you know, I'd worked a lot on the relationship and, and probably has been a a touchstone for growth for me my whole life, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, I realized that I had 
held on to a lot of habitual stories. You know, we, we tend to tell stories about our lives kind of almost like a rote recording. You know, mm-hmm. this happened, then this happened. We like yeah. cart out the story and we start telling it. <laughs> and we're usually the hero and the other person is the <laughs> villain. And I had a lot of stories like that about my mother. And when she asked me that, I had to realize that, you know, there actually had been a lot of good between us, but I just let that drift through my fingers. And But I set in stone every mistake she'd ever made. So that, that was really the beginning of um, a real shift for me in becoming more humble, more human, um, and, and being able to be more generous towards her and to hold her, you know, to hold her in a different way. There's an there's a epigraph I have in the front um, of the book. It's by a, a writer named Deborah Fruche, and she says, every time I look in the rearview mirror, the past has changed and for me, that so much is this this kind of epic mother-daughter story is that as I have moved through the decades of my life, my perception of my history, my perception of the, the characters, the key players in my life has changed. And my perception of myself has grown more honest. You know, yeah. like I've gotten to my own underbelly, my own failings. And I think to write a really good memoir, you have to really move beyond being either the victim or the hero. You have to be a flawed human being, and, and so do all the characters in your book. Mm-hmm. And I, that's part of what took me 10 years, um, was was really getting to the point where at the end, I, I would give like the final version to um, beta readers who are like people who read your book before yeah. it's published, and they would say things like, you know, on this page, I hated you and loved your mother. And on this page, I hated oh, wow. your mother and loved you. And that's, that's really... A sign. That's a great sign. Yeah, so that's how I knew I was finished, <laughs> yeah. actually. I, yeah, I had I done that. it. I had done what I wanted, you know. Yeah. You know, memory is such a fascinating thing. I I really appreciate what you're sharing with that. Like, as we become more self-aware and, and community aware and just, you know, life is such a deep seed of knowledge. I can't tell you, now that I have teenagers, how many times I've apologized to my mom. I'm like, oh my God, like I, <laughs> wow, how did you live with me? Yeah. Like, why am I still alive? <laughs> and she laughs and says, it's okay, honey. They, you know, they come back. It gets, it gets better, but it's this perspective. And I can remember Actually, the you know, I've always kind of joked that my mom is crazy and I have a very different relationship with my mom than you do with yours. But there was and always has been a lot of um, ex- expectations. She she I was supposed to do all of these things in all of these certain ways to make mm-hmm. her look good or because mm-hmm. she thought I should. And, and my growth trajectory was in moving past that. Right. But I'd always kind of thought she was just a little crazy. And I remember when they put my first born in my arms that very first time like it came washed over me like a wave and my mom's in the room and I looked up at her and I said oh my god now I know why you're crazy (laughs) because there's this moment like all of a sudden I was like I would kill somebody for this tiny human and that's fucking crazy well and the, the tiny human becomes more important than you absolutely you know I mean it's like it's like everything gets reshuffled um, yeah. It's interesting. I have um, two. Two. I have an older son who has produced several grandchildren, but my two kids in their twenties have not had children yet. And one of them it really wants to, and the other one is like, I don't know if I'm ever going to do that. <laughs> and it's it's so interesting to watch him, and he focuses on all the things he will lose, mm. and all the things he'll have to give up. Yeah. You know, and he, which is true. <laughs> he doesn't take into account how his heart is going to be cracked open. Yeah. Yeah. That's the part, you know. I I just did that this year with my my partner really wanted a dog. Um <laughs> and I was like, "No, no, no for years. I don't want a dog. I I want to be free. I want to be able to travel. I don't want hair all over the house." I had all my reasons, you know. I don't want a dog that's going to lick my crotch and I don't want to jump <laughs> on people. All those things. Yeah. All those things. <laughs> And then finally, you know, out of, really out of love for her, I said yes, and we got a puppy, and um, who's almost a year old. And it's just been so interesting to open to another being, mm. like a whole new species. Mm-hmm. And it's been, it's really been um, heartwarming and heart opening. The transformation of loving 
someone who is not you, you know, is, is just yeah. so powerful. And, and I, with my mom, I feel like she, you know, when I look back from this vantage point, she's been dead for seven years. I can see that she tried, mm. you know, she failed in a number of instances. She failed, but she wanted to. It's like there was, there was this incredible love and also this incredible dysfunction. Um, th- th- there was a guy I interviewed and he said to me once, he said, it's so hard to talk about the violence and the tenderness in my family because there was so much of both. Yeah. And you I know, get my, that. my family was not a violent family, but there was, you know, there were there were these dichotomies. And then you're as a person, what are you supposed to take from that? You know, yeah. and, and can you hold when I was younger, everything was so black and white. Uh, of course. I'm watching my children go through that right now. And it's uh, painful because it's not nothing's black and white. It just, everything gets more complicated. (laughs) And I know less and less the older I get. (laughs) Less and less and more and more somehow, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or or more self-awareness about how little you know, perhaps. So let's go back just, you know, well, I guess a ways, but you have this really challenging relationship with your mother. The book is, talks all about that, but you also, how old were you when you came out? I was 23, 23 years old. Although I kissed my first girl uh, when I was 19. <laughs> and I was I was living in an ashram uh, where uh-huh. we had taken vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And this, this woman, <laughs> where her, the lesbians go. <laughs> her narr- exactly. A lot, of people, a lot of people were hiding out in there for a lot of different reasons. That was probably one of mine. But anyway, there was a there was a girl, a young woman who was in the community who had I remember she had a Datsun B two ten and she didn't live in the ashram, but she was like we called her a householder. You know, she lived outside. And she picked me up one night and drove me around in her car and she had this southern accent and she just said, I'd just like to kiss you. <laughs> and that I, I like just a remember nice memory. <laughs> that kiss just changed my whole life. It was like, uh-huh. oh my God, this is the kiss I've been waiting for. Aww, you know, all those men like sticking their tongue in my mouth and just <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that was that was the beginning. And but then I just kind of like put it in a box because I was I was celibate, you know, so mm. the the kiss was all that happened. And then, you know, it took me maybe three or four more years. It actually was my best friend had to sit me down. We were working as cocktail waitresses in uh, Mendocino, California, and we were like drinking after our shift one day at this bar, which is what you do when you work in the restaurant business. And she just looked at me. She said, "Laura, you should just face it. You're a lesbian." <laughs> <laughs> like I just couldn't get it myself, and I just started weeping. And I, mm. it was like this. It was like one of these moments of deep recognition of the truth. You know, I I've had maybe four or five of those moments in my whole life where. Mm-hmm. I know that I'm tapped into the deepest truth about myself. And and then I just, you know, then I then I was I'm going to come out, you know, I it became a mission. <laughs> sure. Yeah, once you know and you're ready and you're like you know we have to do this because it's it it's too suffocating not to. Right. Yeah. So how did your family and and for the sake of this conversation your mom take the news? Well, you know, very differently. Um, mm-hmm. When I told my dad, he he was like, "Congratulations!" He lived in San Francisco. He he, <laughs> they were divorced, and he moved out to California to basically become a hippie. He he went to the Esalen Institute and did these like encounter groups, and he he dropped a lot of acid, and and he was a free spirit, you know. And he was like, "Great!" and and he he initiated that we started going every June we would go to the San Francisco Gay Pride Parade. And, um, and, and there was a, the contingent parents and friends of lesbians and gays. It was just starting at that time. This was a really long time ago. It was like a tiny contingent. Now it would be huge. And he had a stolen shopping cart that he had liberated from Safeway down the street. <laughs> and he, he was a musician. So he would decorate this uh, shopping cart with these like... Um, you know, like the inside of those really cheap wine boxes, mm-hmm. they're, they're disgusting. Anyway, inside there's like a, a silver bladder. Yeah. So he would fill those with air and he would tie them to the cart. So it would be like with helium. He would go uh-huh. down, fill them with helium. So they'd be on the cart. He'd decorate it with ribbons and strings and things. And then he had a giant conga drum. And we would 
uh, would be him, and he had a new partner at that time, Ophelia. He and Ophelia and I would, like, walk his cart, you know, a mile and a half over all the, like, railroad tracks and everything with this conga drum and, and these balloons, inside wine box balloons, <laughs> and we would go to Gay Pride, and we would march down the street in this little contingent, and it was so profound because what would happen is that there'd be people on either side of Market Street, which is the main drag where the parade happens, and they'd be like, you know, eight rows thick on either side of the street. And when our little contingent came down the street, people would give us a standing ovation, and they would be roaring. And you could just see people weeping all up and down the street because, you know, the so many gay people are completely tossed out of their families. Yeah. And here was this little contingent of parents standing up for their children. So that was my dad. That was his yeah. reaction, which was That's just amazing. fantastic. Uh, my mother, when I told her, she said, you've confirmed my worst fear about oh. you. <laughs> She's such a oh. such a drama queen. Oh my god! Um, and and so that was her reaction, and and it was and I was on my high horse. You know, I was quoting, you know, probably Mary Daly and <laughs> feminist <laughs> philosophy to her, and she just hurt. And then she said, "I'll never have grandchildren." Oh my god! It was gosh. always all about her. You know, I'll never have grandchildren. Yeah. Um, and I I was living in California then, and I was like really ha- we I think we were meeting at. Um, a family event in Florida, and I just couldn't wait to get back on that airplane and get away from her. But, you know, I, what I want to say about my mom is that that reaction was pretty short-lived. You know, I think in three years, she became an advocate, you know, and uh, she came, you know, she came out to her friends. She didn't feel ashamed that she had a gay mm. daughter. Um, and she, and then she started asking about, you know, my girl, how's, how's Wendy? She was one of my girlfriends, you know, how's this one? How's that one? And, and she actually became an advocate. And when, when I had children, uh, Karen and I had two more children. She already had a son when we met, you know, Tammy claimed them and she would say, Karen is the best daughter-in-law. So she went through a real okay. transformation. Yeah. I and love it, that. I would say it didn't take that long. A few years at the time, it felt really, really hard. You know, yeah. But in retrospect, a few years is not that long for someone to come to terms with something that they've been taught is shameful and wrong. And, and of course, she was wrong about the grandchildren. You know, I had kids. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and... I produced the grandchildren. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and she, would, she would proudly say, you know, when I was pregnant, she told me, we, we were just starting to kind of work our way back towards each other. And I, there was a letter she wrote me where she said, you know, I'm telling ch- telling my friends that you have conceived a child through donor insemination um, and that you're very happy about becoming a mother and that you're with a very nice woman and mm. I'm happy for you. So, you know, she changed. Yeah, I think for narcissists, and it certainly sounds like your mother was one, um, that's about the best they can do. Like, that's a that's pretty high growth. I think for for people who are coming so far uh, from the other side to say, this is the truth. You are very happy. I feel feel like that's a win. Yeah. I mean, it's I'm just remembering when at the end of her life, um, when she had dementia, you know, those of you people listening who have had a relative or family member with dementia, you know that they repeat themselves a lot, Mm -hmm. you know, different phases. Mm -hmm. And she had these certain stock phrases that she would say over and over, and one of them was, "You're the best daughter in the whole world." Mm. Like, and and it was so poignant for her to say that. I, I heard it every time I would go over, which was pretty much every day to see her, because I'd longed to hear those words my whole life. But it was only when she kind of was no longer herself yeah. that she was able to say it. And the other thing she said, which always cracked me up, she'd say. Who says lesbians shouldn't have children? You and Karen have done such a good job with those kids. <laughs> she, would, she would cart that out anywhere, anytime. And it was, <laughs> you know, there, was a, there was humor and pathos in becoming her caregiver, definitely. And it's interesting. You, you, you said, uh, and I actually write about this in my book that I uh, just released, Fuck Fearless. It was a conversation that I'd had with my grandmother, um, 
that she couldn't do that until she wasn't really herself anymore. And and I tend to look at that exactly opposite. And and I interviewed a woman named Alua Arthur, who is a death doula here on the show. I think I'm pretty sure Alua was episode 40. It was a long time ago. Uh, and I spoke with Alua when I was writing this chapter is that I believe humans become more themselves, mm. even if they have dementia, even if their memory is gone. Our truest selves present ourselves when all of the rest of the things are gone, when they don't matter, when the fear of rejection doesn't matter, when we don't have to put on show, when we don't have to worry about any of it. And so to me, that gives me so much comfort to think that was really, those were her real feelings. She was finally able to express those for you. Yeah. I mean, I've watched people with dementia or Alzheimer's, and sometimes they go in a direction of becoming sweet. And sometimes and they get mean, sometimes right? Sometimes they yeah. get mean as hell, yeah. and they were not mean before. So, yeah. I, you know, I don't really understand why. Um, in my case, I was lucky. My mother turned sweet. I mean, she still, yeah. there were some very, very difficult times. Mm-hmm. Um, I, You know, I had to struggle a lot to separate the past from what was happening now. That was really a struggle for me because yes. when, when she came to California, I lost that 3,000 mile buffer <laughs> we had had between us, which I think enabled us to have kind of a yes. functional, cordial relationship because I knew she was going home, you know. Um, I know that feeling. My mom's only three hours away and I love her, but I'm also glad she's not close enough to just pop in. <laughs> right. So, so it, that really... Um, put a lot more pressure. And and also the early stages of dementia involved a lot of anxiety. It involved um, sharp emotions, a lot of rage, a lot like from like zero to a hundred in two seconds. Mm -hmm. And those qualities, that, that emotional volatility was exactly what I dealt with as a child. And so I got really triggered Um, Even though I felt like I I wanted to be there for her, I wanted to be the good daughter, but on the inside, so much was coming up for me. I mean, I ended up having to get into therapy while I was caring for her because there were just, it was, you know, I was starting to lose it and I I didn't want to lose it, you know. I mean, I think that probably happens for people who don't have the traumatic history that you have with your parent as you're doing elder care. Like there's just a lot. I'm a big fan of therapy. Everybody should go to therapy. <laughs> um, Laura, I'd be curious to know how, if at all, your memoir journey, which you started, I mean, I'm doing the math here. Your mom's been gone seven years. It took you 10 years to write the book. The book is now out. So you just started before she passed. How, if at all, did that affect your partner, your kids, your family? Uh, well, it's had a huge effect because I've been, largely because I've been preoccupied. I mean, mm-hmm. I've been in, deeply in this other world. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you know, when when, my, when Karen met me, I already was an author. She sort of <laughs> knew what she was getting into <laughs> to some degree. Um, that, you know, that I go into almost like a fugue state where I'm just like, everything is the book, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and everything is revolving around that. And I'm just not as available. So I think that impacted them. Um, I also was writing about them. I mean, this, Mm -hmm. my mother and I are clearly the, the two huge larger than life characters in this memoir, but it happened in the context of my family, you know, so Karen is a character. Um, the two younger kids are characters. Um, my older son, I think makes like a couple little cameos, but he wasn't really involved with my mother at all. Um, and so I had to really talk to them about it. I needed to get their buy-in um, because I was going to be writing about them. And I, I actually tried to pretty much minimize my portrayal of them, uh, both Makes in terms sense. of numbers of words on the page, but also I didn't, I didn't make them major characters. I didn't really reveal anything intimate about them. You know, my brother, my mother, and I, it's all out there on the page. But I felt like I needed to protect my, um, and my my brother gave me his permission. I, I felt like I needed to protect uh, the members of my family and and sure. you know who were all private people. And I think it's challenging having a memoirist in the family. Um, yeah, you know, just okay. really hard. You know, like because and but it's not that they're not on the page. It's my portrayal of them. And I think that's right. Yeah, you know, pe- people say to me things like 
God, Laura, you make yourself so vulnerable, or I feel like I really know you. And Mm. yes, you know the literary representation of me that I created on the page, but when you you craft a character out of yourself, you don't include everything. I mean, you know this. Absolutely. And vulnerability does not require you to to reveal everything or turn yourself inside out. Well, I, I could be very vulnerable about something that happened 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. It's very different than being vulnerable about what I'm going through right now. So to me, once I've... You know, maybe the first draft of writing something, I could be like sobbing my guts out because it's just so painful because you have to go back in and feel it to write it well. You know, you can't write it from this abstract distance of time. So you have to go in, you have to write it. But then then there's so many rewrites. You know, I I would say I rewrote every scene in this book a hundred times. So as you rewrite it, it becomes more of a story and less of a documentation of your history. And you emphasize certain things, you de-emphasize certain things, you start a scene at a certain point, you lop off everything that happened before, you know, you end it at a certain point, you lop off what happened afterwards. Sometimes you eliminate characters who are extraneous. You know, sometimes I took two similar events and combined them into one scene. So, you know, I took some liberties as a storyteller, and I, I tell the reader very clearly, you know, what I what liberties I took and what I didn't take. But I st- I feel more distant from these stories now. You know, when I it's interesting when I did the audio book, and I was reading it, I felt a lot of emotion. I'll bet there there's something about yes. about actually saying these words out loud. I it it was there were times I felt near tears reading that audio book because I was right back in the experience in a way that. I didn't feel just writing it, you know, so I'm, I'm grateful that I did the audio book for that reason. I love that. that. I think that makes a lot of sense. There's something about the spoken word. And actually that leads into the, the last thing I wanted to, to talk about, um, really wanted to make sure I talked about with you here today is it's been months since we first connected and I invited you to be a guest on the show and we were purposely trying to plan it around your book launch. So I'm really glad we were able to do that. But you, your status in the LGBTQ community, in your community, is important to you. And that's, and I opened with that storytelling, right? Being able to tell our story and hear other people's stories. And can you speak a little bit to what it means to you to be part of the community? And, and maybe what would you want to say to the younger people in the community? Because um, you, you, you were getting partnered and married, and I don't know if you're married or not, doesn't matter, but having children using a donor, which you had a a known donor. And I'd love to, I'm curious just sort of about that, the decision-making known donor versus unknown donor. I think that's so personal and so challenging. But you were doing this, really, the people who were doing it were kind of doing it underground back then. This was not an, an out loud thing in most of the country. And I'd love to hear a little bit about that from you. Well, I, I think I'm going to probably give you a disappointing answer um, because I think I'm a little... Um, younger than the people you're talking about, and I, I when and also I chose to live in Santa Cruz, California. That's like true. I moved. You here. were in so, a very so I came. Community. To, I came yeah. to live in a place very consciously chosen, where I would be in a little bubble where it would not be an issue. Like I have met very little homophobia here. You know, occasionally things happen. That's lovely. And and raise children also in a community where they would go to school and they would not be the first kids of lesbian parents. Mm. And that was really important. Now, if we had lived anywhere else, you know, aside from like Berkeley or Northampton, Massachusetts. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in Indianapolis. I can assure you 20, 25 years ago, I I didn't know any lesbian families. So, yeah, there was actually when I when I had my kids, the the two younger ones, there was like a gay. They called it the gaby boom. <laughs> of that. Uh, <laughs> and so there were lots of other people having children. So I, I have not experienced it um, as a challenge. I also, you know, have a certain amount of privilege in my life that has protected me from mm. that becoming um, a challenge. And I didn't really want my kids to have to fight over it, you know, and, and have it be really challenging. And and mm-hmm. the feedback they got a lot was, wow, that's really cool. I wish I could have two moms. Yeah. 
That's you know, awesome. and I don't. It may be that they're protecting me from some terrible homophobic experience that they had because they had lesbian parents, but I have. Ne- they have never said that to me. Um, you probably would know. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know. You know, kids in their twenties don't tell you everything. That's true. Uh, nor should they. Uh, right. But I've asked. I'm open to it. Um, and it sounds like it sounds like all it did was give them street cred, you know, <laughs> really. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so very quickly, can you share a little bit about and I don't want to get too much into your your deep personal stuff, but the decision, because we do have a lot of listeners who are LGBTQ and who want to raise families. And there are questions about uh, known donor versus unknown donor and sort of what that process was like for you. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you as much as I'm allowed to talk about because this, you know, I'm not the only person involved in this. Absolutely. um, I wanted a known donor. I, I felt like, and this is just a personal choice. You know, I wanted my children to be able to know their biological father. Um, and they do. And they do. Okay, um, that's lovely. And um, at first, I actually had one donor I used who was more than an acquaintance, someone I had met through work. Um, and he, we tried, I tried to get pregnant using frozen sperm that he shipped across the country because he was in New England, I was in California. And I had to go for these intrauterine I forget what they were. It was so long ago. Um, right. Anyway, these inseminations. And it was all kind of medicalized and expensive. Yes. And um, I didn't get pregnant. Um, I tried for a year, and I, uh-huh. I never got pregnant with his sperm. And I think what – and he had three kids. So I, that was one of my stipulations. I wanted my – if I had a known donor, I wanted them to already have children. Mm, so you because, knew that they were fertile. Well, that and also that they knew what it meant to have a child. Because mm. I had a friend – who um, decided to get pregnant with a gay man, a lesbian friend who decided to get pregnant with a gay man. And the whole thing just blew up. I mean, it became so terrible because um, the the father, the biological father, when he this baby was born, just realized he wanted to have a relationship with his child. That just mm. like And that was it, not part of the deal. And that was not part of the deal. And so then it could just created years of strife and struggle and and I've seen other situations like that. So um I I, I wanted some that was one, why I had the rule that they had to be a father already because Makes if sense. they were a father they would have an idea of what they were getting into in a way that someone who had never been a parent um, would. So that was one of my only stipulations. And then I couldn't get pregnant um, with him. And then I, I just went, I, and I felt so vulnerable. I, I used to try to go up, like I didn't know that many men to begin with <laughs> at that time of my life. In your and, California lesbian community. Yeah, not too many men. <laughs> you know, um, but I said to Karen, I, I really want you to be the one to find someone. Like that's your job. I just feel too vulnerable. And she did. And I, I can't talk about who the person was, but it was someone sure. who was already in our life. Uh, was in our life before and is still in our life and mm. is like uh, kind of plays the role of an uncle. And um, we always told the kids, you know, like I, we had des- our decision actually was when they start asking who their father is, that's when we'll tell them. Mm. But we didn't talk about it in public. Now, sure. I would have like I didn't feel any need to hide it. But the other three pers- people involved, Karen, this man and his wife, they were all much more private. So I went along with, we're not sure. going to tell anyone. Um, but, you know, as the kids grew up, it became really obvious just looking when we were all <laughs> sitting at the table together, people started putting two and two together. Uh-huh. You know, so so eventually, but I think we all wanted to um, establish the right lines of relationship. Like it was important that Karen and I be this child's parents. And yes. that the donor and his wife are not their parents. Yes. And, you know, when you are in a heterosexual society and people would often make Karen invisible, they would they would talk to me as the parent and she would just be off to the side. You know, or if they ever met the donor, then they would they would want to put put the two of us together like we were a heterosexual couple. So we had to fight against that yeah. and really establish this is our family. You know, and this person over here is like a special uncle. Yeah. Um, and that worked out really well for us. I mean, I think we were very lucky. We're all still really good friends. The, the kids are grown and they, you know, they always want to go visit. 
uh, this other family when they come to California, and mm. we're like family together. But I love that. It, it had to be really clear that we were the nuclear family unit. Yeah, and yeah. and it strong took some boundaries time. required yes, to make that work. Strong boundaries required, um, and and just the whole world doesn't want to acknowledge it. And I think, I think that's been painful for my sure. spouse. You know, to to always be the one who's like, who are and who are you? <laughs> And who are you? Like, who is this person? Mm, and they're just, yeah. they're looking at me and talking to me, and she's just standing there. Um, so, you know, you still have to fight some of that kind of yeah. um, ignorance. But I would say because of where we chose to live, yeah. it was pretty much a non-issue. I'm glad to hear that. That's nice. It's nice to know. It's not the story we hear from a lot of people in a lot of places. So I love that. And it's just a reminder Maybe for folks just to remember that whatever it is you're experiencing in your community, it's not like that all over the world, good or bad, right? There are other experiences people are having, um, even people who are in similar situations as you. It's it's good to remember that it's a big, wide world out there and, and everyone's um, experiencing maybe the same thing in a very different way. But having that wonderful, joyous experience, having your beautiful family seems like a really great time to lead into a question that I ask every week. And I love this question. I'm especially loving it right now. Uh, and for both of us, as we have these books out, they've made bestseller. We've worked our asses off. It's really exciting. So Laura, how do you like to celebrate? Um, I I like to be out in nature. That's, that's mm. kind of my goat. That's my church. Um, and I, I can be very driven in my life, which, you know, is I accomplish a lot of things and accomplishing getting this book out, which had many obstacles. Sure. But it's also hard for me to stop my momentum and, and like get away from the list and the social media and the, like what's next, what's next. And I find the best way to do that is to, you know, take my dog um, and go down to the beach and mm. just start walking in the water and, you know, throwing a Frisbee. Or well, I live in Santa Cruz, California, and there's good weather pretty much all year. And there's, you know, redwoods in one direction. There's the ocean in the other direction. So I'm just surrounded by beauty. And just walking out in that, I think, is is number one. And then sometimes mm. just, you know, I remember I would in the old days, I would come back from some book tour. This is from previous books. <laughs> and Karen would just be like, just do the dishes. Uh, <laughs> or she would just, ha she would just ha hand me a regular. baby. <laughs> hand me a baby. Like, your turn, you're on. Yeah, change this diaper, you know. Yeah. And that, I find that, that uh, plugging into daily life really, really helps. Um, and, mm. and, and things that embody me. You know, I spent a lot of my life dissociated because of my childhood trauma. Mm. So, you know, learning to be in my body. I'm a swimmer. I go to the pool and everything. I just let go of everything. Oh, I love that. Learning to be in your body. What a fucking spectacular way to celebrate. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm going to sit with that all day. Learning to be in your body as form of celebration. Y'all, ooh, that's my, I mean, I love this whole conversation, but that, I'm going to sit with that. That's a really... What a beautiful way to celebrate. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, no problem. Um, but Laura, what is your favorite charitable organization to support? Uh, I, I would say two. One is the National Center for Lesbian Rights, mm. you know, who are advocating for the people who don't live in Santa Cruz, California, who are dealing right. with housing yes. discrimination, job discrimination, who are having children taken away from them in custody cases or they can't adopt. Um, so I really support them because I think they do incredible advocacy work. Um, and the other is the the Southern Poverty Law Center mm, me um, too. because they um, they do so much to fight for civil rights um, and, and against racism and against, you know, white supremacy. And boy, do we need that right now. Boy, do we. Boy, do we. Both excellent um, organizations. They will both get to be our charity of the week, charities of the week. And I ask that question just because I think part of, of choosing bravely, part of living an intentionally brave life must require making it that, about more than just us. And we're called together as a global community of people to love and support one another and to lift each other up. And I love getting to hear each week um, 
what your favorite charity is, what the guest's favorite charity is, so that we can widen that circle of hope and giving. So thank you for sharing that with us. Laura, will you give your three words one last time? Courage, estrangement, and connection. Yes. I mean, I think those are beautiful. I get it. We've talked, I think, about all of those words, and and it makes perfect sense to me that you picked them. They're wonderful. Laura, this was a delight. Congratulations on the best-selling book. I hope that you plan to celebrate by getting out in nature in your body and re- rest <laughs> a little, because I don't know if you're anything like me, like the crash is hard. Hope you built in some time to rest. Yeah. Yeah, I have. Yeah. I, I've want just one more thing I want to say uh, yeah. for people listening is that um, I have posted the first five chapters um, of the burning light of two stars on my website. And it's a lot bigger um, sample than you get on Amazon. And I just want to invite people to go read those chapters. Um, Absolutely. And, and what is you, your website? It, so it's Laura, it's www.lauradavis.net forward slash chapters. So it's lauradavis.net slash chapters. Um, and there's also links to, you know, bu- buying the audiobook or the ebook from all the different sellers that have them. Yes, I'm going to get the audiobook from Libro.fm, which is a sponsor of this podcast and my favorite place to listen to audiobooks. And Laura, you do writing retreats and teaching. What's the best way for people if they're curious, they want to know more to check out? I'm sure it's your website, but I'll let you say it again. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I. Uh, since the pandemic, I've taken all my writing classes online, so people can attend from anywhere. And I teach both weekly classes, um, but I'm also 2022. I'm going to start doing workshops actually in person. I'm taking a group to Tuscany in oh, June. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't even like have a, anything I want to write, but I want to come well, with it's, you. It's not really, the focus is not so much writing. You know, it's a couple hours of writing a day, and then the rest of the day we do yoga, and then we go on some kind of exploration in the afternoon to like a, wi- a winery or a vineyard or, you know, um, well, a, ta- a walled amazing. town or something like that. So I'm really looking forward to that. I've tried to have that trip three times and I've had to cancel um, so anyway, you could you could learn about my retreats, my classes, and my workshops at lauradavis.net. Um, on Facebook, I am The Writer's Journey uh, with no apostrophe. And um, on Instagram, Laura Sari, S-A-R-I Davis, Laura Sari Davis. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here and for just sharing your story with us. It's such a treat such a pleasure. Um, and I look forward to continuing to following your journey, Laura. Okay. Sounds great. Thanks for having me on the show. Good luck with your book. Thank you so much. All right, folks. I hope that you enjoyed this as much as I did. I'd love to hear your feedback. You can DM me on any of the social medias. I always respond. Email me at heathervickeryandco.com. Be sure to tune in next week as well. We will give you a brand new guest, a brand new story. And I just want to remind you, each and every day to go out and choose bravely. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Hey friends, I want to share something really exciting with you. We already know you enjoy listening to podcasts because you're listening to this one, but I'm also betting you enjoy audiobooks. And hey, listen, if you don't already enjoy audiobooks, then it's time to check them out. That's why I'm really excited to share Libro.fm with you. They are an incredible new platform for listening to audiobooks. And by choosing Libro.fm over other audiobook services, you are supporting a local bookstore of your choice and investing in your local community. Libro.fm offers over 150,000 audiobooks via their primary platform, which, by the way, they built with love and from scratch because they're a small business also. They even offer bookseller recommendations for great audiobook options. You can sign up right now via www.vickeryandco.com slash librofm. That's vickeryandco.com slash L-I-B-R-O-F-M. And when you do, you'll get one free audiobook of your choice and the proceeds will go to your favorite local bookstore. Now, check what I just said there. You're going to get a free book. And the proceeds are still going to go to your local bookstore because Libro.fm makes sure that their booksellers get paid even when they give a promo to customers. 
I've listened to over 20 audiobooks this year alone. I especially love listening to memoirs read by the author, and it feels great knowing that all of my purchases support my local bookstore, The Book Table, in Oak Park, Illinois. Libro.fm. The same audiobooks, the same price, but a completely different story. Check them out right now at vickeryandco.com slash librofm. Have you ever thought about starting a podcast? Maybe you've had this thought and then quickly shut it down because who has the time? Or you don't know how, or gosh, it just all seems too hard. If you have something to share with the world, we want to encourage you to get your message out. The world needs to hear it. Did you know that 50% of all homes are podcast fans? If you've ever wondered about having your own podcast or how it can increase your business or get your message across, then please join me and the other experts from the Podcast Power Academy for our monthly free Q&A session. It's called, So You Want to Start a Podcast? This casual live conversation will help you understand how podcasting can be a great decision, why now is the best time to get started, and how to get into action with it. Visit podcastpoweracademy.com to learn more. You've been listening to The Brave Files, stories of people living courageously. To learn more about the show, find our show notes and full episode transcripts, or to get some great bonus content, visit thebravefilespodcast.com. And we would love to know what you think of the show. You can give us a call at 312-646-0205. Let us know your thoughts on the episode, the show in general, or maybe share with us how you're out choosing bravely. This episode is brought to you by Vickery & Co. Success Coaching. Coaching that helps you maintain a life well-lived and a business well-run. Learn more at vickeryandco.com. Our music was created and produced in a custom collaboration with Matt Lewis from ML Creative Consulting, a boutique firm dedicated to helping clients identify their unique sound and amplify their brand with custom delivered soundtracks. We couldn't do any of this without our extraordinary audio engineer, Andrew Olson. Learn more about him and check out his work at findandrewolson.com. And special thanks to everyone on Team Brave from our producers, associate producers, copy editors, writers, and support team. Special thanks to Molly, Mary, Kim, Sabra, and Sabrina. I'm your host and executive producer, Heather Vickery. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next week.